I'm going to talk about you. Don't get too paranoid. I'm going to talk about you today because I know that, well, let's just face reality. All of us go through hard times, don't we? We all have hard times. And we need hope because hope helps us in the hard times that we all have. But hope is also developed during those hard times. We're going to see some incredible truth today, but first we're going to start so very importantly. Take your Bible in hand. As we make this declaration, let's stand together and say, this is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You'll want to open up to Romans chapter number 5. I hope you have your Bibles with you. I encourage you to bring them because there are things that you may want to mark in your Bible that will help you to recall what we have shared together when you're reading through your Bible and come again across this passage, Romans chapter number 5, and we're going to share these first five verses. Romans chapter 5, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Well, that's got to be a mistake. No, it says not only that, we also glory in tribulations. That's stupid. I'm just speaking from the natural man, because the natural man doesn't understand the things of God, does it? So he says, you're having a hard time? Wow, that's fantastic. You, you, you want to slug him about that point, right? He says, but we, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Whew. That's some incredible truth. Hope is so very important, isn't it? I'd like you to take a moment, just interact with me. Briefly share with me a time that you needed hope. Maybe it was a time of illness or a time of unemployment or a time of something that you struggled in your life and you just needed some hope to get through. Just briefly share one sentence. What was that time that you needed hope? And while you text that to me, I got to tell you about the preacher who had a bit of a problem in bibing, meaning he was drinking. The preacher was pretty well known throughout the community that he had a bit of a drinking problem. So when he was driving down the road and the police officer saw him crossing the line and waving back and forth in his car, the police officer put on the sirens, pulled him over, and said, uh, Good afternoon, Pastor. He said, Oh, good afternoon, officer. And the officer says, Have you been drinking, Pastor? He said, oh, no, 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 nothing but water, nothing but water. Just have water in my thermos here, that's it. The officer says, well, you wouldn't mind then if I smelled your water, would you? And he says, oh, of course not. And he hands it to the officer, and the officer, pastor, this doesn't smell like water. This smells like wine. And the pastor says, oh, my, Jesus did it again. Now, some people like to blame the devil. Some people like to blame God. But what we need to see is God has something 
something in the midst of our circumstances and situations which transcends our understanding. Let me share with you some of what well, we have some wonderful ones here. Had surgery that went wrong and the doctor would not help afterwards. <sighs> That's a time of desperation, a time you need hope. This one says, I went to a place where I should have not gone, got my butt in trouble. Tough time where you needed hope. When taking, sometimes, you know, that, that's really good because that was honest. That said, you know what, I did it. It's my fault. Sometimes we're in our circumstances because of our own stupid choices. Let's be honest. Sometimes we're in our circumstances because someone else's stupid choices. It happens, but we can't blame them because sometimes they're in bad problem because of our stupid choices. Ah, when taking care of my mom with dementia near the end of her life, what a time of needing hope. On my way to church, braked on the hard ice, woo, and there I went. Time you need hope. This one says, when it seemed like the pandemic would never end. Depending upon who you listen to, it was over a long time ago, it never started, or it's still going on. <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> When my husband went to heaven, that would be a time we need hope. Hope is so essential. And this one says, with all the craziness in our government, we need hope that it will change soon. <laughs> There's a lot of times we need hope. Hope is so essential, isn't it? So as we talk, I want to first of all just bring us to the fact that hope helps in hard times. It really does. It's essential for hard times. Four years ago, I told you this. This was a statement I made to the family four years ago. I told you four years ago, hope is integral. It's foundational essence of Christianity. It is inextricably linked to faith. The struggle for hope is a battle all of us face at various times in our lives, and therein lies our deep-seated need for faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith carves out hope. It serves hope. It sustains hope. And hope is much more than motivation. Much, much more. Hope is energy. Hope is power. Paul said there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest, but without hope, love is only a dream. We need hope. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the sustaining power of hope. And I'm going to use a medical experiment that demonstrates it quite well, but I want to state at the very beginning I am reporting these results. I am not approving of the methodology. I personally find it very uncomfortable in animal experimentation. I'm just, I love animals, okay? But the results of this show us some incredible truth that I think we need to absorb this morning. So if you'll forgive me for that, I want to share with you a 1950s study. Yes, this is over 70 years ago this study came out. Kurt Richter, who is a Harvard graduate and Johns Hopkins scientist, was studying how long a rat would be able to stay swimming took the rats and put them into a clear glass cylinder filled partway with water, and it was impossible for the rat to crawl out of the cylinder. How long could the rat swim before the rats were drowned? The average rat lasted 15 minutes, continued to swim as best it could. I would say it did the doggy paddle, but it was the rat paddle. Fifteen minutes, that was the average time. But then he did something else. Dr. Richter rescued the rat right before drowning. Took the rat out, dried it off, warmed it up, and then put it back in. Then the rat had a sense of, there's a possibility I could be rescued again. And the rats then swam before drowning for 60 hours, not minutes, hours straight.
straight. They survived 240 times longer because they had a little bit of hope. That's pretty significant, isn't it? If you can go through a difficult time without hope, just imagine what you can do with a lot of hope. Hope can transform your circumstances by changing you. And that's what God is so interested in doing. But sometimes we feel like we're stuck without hope, that there's not a bunch of hope, not even a little bit of hope. Sometimes we feel like the situation is hopeless. And in those times we feel like we're stuck, can't see a way out. It's not possible. And sometimes in your life, can I say this? I hope you experience that. Why would you wish that upon me, Pastor? Because I have been there. And it was in those times where it seemed dire, desperate, and hopeless. Those were the times that I learned the greatest, that God is great. God is faithful. God sustains. God is, I call him my kind one. He is. You can learn more in those moments of difficulty and pain than I could teach you in a lifetime. When you experience the presence of God in the midst of a hopeless situation. I don't know if you've ever been in one. They, they have them. They've become rather in vogue. They're called escape rooms. It's a kind of a novelty, an entertainment experience where you get locked into a room and in order to get out of the escape room, in a limited time, you must solve some puzzles, you must work through some clues, you must exercise some actions to help you find the way to escape the room. People pay big money for these escape room experiences. To be put in a situation that seems hopeless, to try to discover if there's a way that they can get out. But what if you went into the escape room, and you already knew the way out. What if someone had told you, this is all you need to do? There's a book on the shelf here. Pull that book, open it, and you will find, if somebody told you, and you go into there, you don't have to feel despair at all then, do you? What if you already knew the way out? Well, hope gives you that vantage point. Have you ever been in a either a corn maze or a, a mirror maze. How many have ever been in a maze? You, it's kind of a unique experience, isn't it? I remember as a little kid, I was about five years old at a carnival going through a maze of mirrors. Now, it, it was dimly lit, and it just was so confusing. It took me the longest time. In fact, it took my older brother to help say, Mark, this way, this way, to lead me out of the maze when everything seemed to be reflecting and confusing. I had my older brother to help me find my way out of the maze. When you can have an overhead view like God does, God can look at the maze and say, okay, here's the way out. It's just this simple. You don't go, no, not that way. No, not this. Go over this way. That doesn't seem like the right way. Trust me. We need God's vantage point. You may not see a way out of the maze at all. You may not see a way out of your situation at all, but that's where faith comes. You trust God that he's already prepared a way out. You let Jesus lead you because he's your older brother who knows exactly where you need to go. Now, this is what Paul means when he says we walk by faith, not by sight. Because in reality, there are times within our lives, you are not going to see a solution. You are not going to see a way out of the struggle. You're not going to see a way out of the problem. You can't see it. But that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Because we have a confidence that God, the kind one, He's at work within our lives. He has a purpose for all that we're going through. 
as part of hope's vantage point. And that's where faith connects with hope. They're inextricably linked together. Faith feeds your hope in the hard times. We say, I don't have hope. Your faith is a substance of things hoped for. It feeds it. Hope, hope takes you to be able to go beyond what you can view. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I know he's going to get me into heaven. My hope has a confidence. And by faith, just like we saw in the book of Zechariah, hope perceives mountains. They're just molehills in reality. Because when God gets done with your situation, wow, it's going to be so different. We absolutely need hope in hard times, but hope also comes from the hard times. You need to understand that because it is natural for us, understand please, it is natural for us to avoid pain. I don't know anybody who likes pain. Not sure of anyone who thinks pain is fun. If you do, that is called masochistic and it is psychologically unhealthy. <laughs> We avoid pain. That's, that's normal. That's healthy. That's, that's what I would expect you to do. But know this, that it is in those painful, difficult, hard times that hope finds fertile ground. I want you to understand hope is developed in hard times. Let's chat about that for a bit. Takes us back to the very scripture we began with this morning, Romans chapter 5, telling us, therefore, having been justified by faith, what a powerful thing faith is. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes! Wow! Uh, oh, and through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let me break that down just a little bit. I, th I think it's healthy for us because we need to understand we have been justified by faith. And what does justified really mean? Justified means, well, just as if I'd never sinned. Wow. Justified is just as if I'd never sinned. I have peace with God because my sin has been washed away, completely forgiven. He's not holding it against you. You have peace because it's just like you never, ever did sin. That's how greatly the blood of Christ cleanses you. So we have peace with God because of what he did. And though we also, through this also, through Jesus, we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I, I, I think it's fun to rejoice in hope. You got hope, you feel like rejoicing. Faith gives you access to grace, which is favor. Now, some people say that's unmerited favor. Yes, but that's not what charis means. Charis has nothing to do with merit or lack of merit. We talk about grace's unmerited favor. It is true. It is an unmerited. It is not by our works. It's nothing we have done to deserve it. But the word charis means just favor. It's a position of favor, a position that leads to rejoicing in hope of God's glory. I've got this favor with God, his complete provision, his protection. He gives me his favor. You have access. You into this favor situation. Now, I, I'm going to have to make a confession to you. I'm God's favorite. <laughs> oh, yeah, they say, you know, every family, there's that favorite one, right? Yeah, I'm God's favorite. I am. I have absolutely no doubt about that. I'm God's favorite. And so are you. So, whoa, 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 wait a minute. How can you can't have like two favorites? That would be like two firsts. Yep. You can have that with God because God is God and He's no respecter of persons. 
And so I am his favorite, and so are you. And you can walk in that relationship of he, he favors me. That's what grace is all about. He favors me. You can say I don't deserve it, and that is absolutely true, no doubt about it, but that does not nullify the very importance of he favors you. You are his favorite. He favors you. I like being favored. That gives you an advantage. I like having an advantage. I like having that vantage point of grace. Now we got that grace. You're his favorite. And knowing that you are his favorite, we can then look, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Why? Because I'm his favorite. And if I'm his favorite, he's surely going to take care of me, isn't he? And if you are his favorite, isn't he surely going to take care of you? If you are his favorite, you can glory in tribulations knowing that knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. That means that ability to sustain, to continue, to do the rat paddle. <laughs> To when everything seems like there's just no way out, to know that you are his favorite. You can hang in there because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So you are not alone, not a chance, not for a minute. He would never leave you. You're his favorite. And that tribulation, it produces perseverance, that sustaining strength. And that perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, as you walk through that and do the math, one leads to the next, doesn't it? It's tribulation that produces perseverance, character, and then finally hope. We need some of this in our lives. That doesn't mean that God produces it for you. God's not the one who's doing harsher, difficult things for you. The scripture says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variance or shadow of turning. There's no dark side to God. But let's go back to the admission that somebody made, I screwed up. God gives you a free will and the ability to screw up. And sometimes we do. And sometimes somebody else screws up and we inherit the consequences of that. They sometimes have to deal with ours. But God doesn't cause it. But God certainly uses it. And God filters it. You need to understand that. He, Father, filters it because of your favor. Father's favor filters Say that with me. Father's favor filters. Say it again. Father's favor filters. And it does. God's favor for you filters the circumstances and situations. He will never, the scripture says, he will never give you more than you can handle without providing a way out. Right? You're not stuck in the cylinder. He says, I will never, never give you more than you can handle without providing a way out. God will provide a way out for you because Father's favor filters and you're his favorite. So uh, some of that tribulation is not such a bad thing. It's producing something important, hope, and we need hope. And not only that, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now I said we're rejoicing in hope and we glory in tribulation. Rejoicing in glory. I can guarantee you can learn something that you did not know before. Both of those words are exactly the same word in Greek. The word for rejoicing and the word for glory are both the same word in Greek. Really? Why are they translated differently? Because the word is so rich and full, it's difficult to put it into English with just one word. Kakomitha is the word for rejoicing and for glory, not the normal word you would have for rejoicing. Normally it would be Cairo, I rejoice. But this is Kokomitha. And what does it mean? Neck upright. 
Yeah. Literally. It means neck, upright. That's what the word literally means in Greek. But it has so many nuances to it, so many important dimensions to it. Rejoicing in hope, glory in tribulation, same Greek word. And it properly means living with your your head held up high. Living with your head held up high. I'm rejoicing in hope. I'm glorying in tribulation. Normally, in tribulation, it's like, oh, your head's hanging down, right? Yeah. No, he says, we hold our head up in tribulation. Boasting that from a particular vantage point, we call that vantage point favor, grace. Having the right base of operation to deal success successfully with a matter. In other words, I, I can hold my head up even in the tribulation because I got what it takes to get through it. I'm God's favorite. I've got his favor. I'm going to get through this because I know that I know he never fails. And I know that I know he never will. I don't understand what's going on. Sometimes you will have not even the slightest clue. But that's when you just say, I don't understand this. I don't get it. I don't like it. But I'm going to trust you in the midst of it. Because with that vantage point, you have the right space of operation to successfully deal with the matter. This is favor. The position of favor allows us to glory, be excited, even in tribulations, even in hard times, even in struggles. But you have to see yourself the way God sees you. You have to understand what God is trying to communicate to you about who you are and whose you are. You're you're his. You're his favorite. You're his favored one. There's no way around it. You might think, well, pastor, you might be, but I'm like the black sheep of a family. Uh Uh-uh. Sorry, Jesus washed you. (laughs) You got no black sheep. I used to say Paul was the greatest sinner. Paul said that. He said, I am the chief of sinners. He used present indicative active form. Meaning right now, right here, saved apostle doing great works, but he said, I am present indicative active form. I am the chief of sinners. And I've said in the past, the only reason Paul could make that claim is I wasn't born yet. the reality is you and I, we are all favored. And we need to allow that favor to encourage us because why? Because we know the results of tribulation when we're walking in his favor. The result of the tribulation is going to be some perseverance. We're going to learn to hang in there longer. And that perseverance is going to develop character within our lives. And that character is going to give us hope. We need this. Tribulation, hard times, produces perseverance to hang in there longer. The perseverance produces the character, and character produces hope. And you need hope. Now, this word produces, this is so important, so essential, because if you miss this, you're going to miss out on what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak in this incredible verse. Produces. Kaptekazette is not simple byproduct. Oh, this is what happens naturally. This is what occurs. This is, you know, what happens. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean a natural byproduct. It means an exact, definite conclusion. It is purposeful, not accidental. Because Father's favor filters. And because Father's favor filters... He only allows in what he will provide a way out for and what will help you to grow in your perseverance, character, and hope. It is all according to a precise plan. And you look at it and you say, this stinks, I hate it, I can't believe you're letting me go through this, God. Why are you letting this happen to me? And if you've never asked that question, you haven't been quite where you need to be yet. 
Because when you get desperate, when you come to that place, you say, I don't understand this. I don't get this. I don't know why you're letting this happen. I, you could have changed this. You could have prevented this. You could step in. And God is working according to a precise plan. This is not haphazard. This is not accidental. Father's favor has filtered and has a purpose. So instead of asking, why? Why did you let this happen to me? We need to say instead, Father's favor filters, so what is it you're trying to teach me? Instead of why, what? What are you trying to teach me? What do you want me to take out of this? What do you want to do in my life? That's important. You need to understand that it's okay for you to be uncomfortable sometimes. You don't like it. Of course you don't like it. If you liked it, we're back to earlier. You're a masochist, not psychologically healthy. No, you're not supposed to like being uncomfortable. But God is more concerned about your character than your comfort. Why? Well, you're not going to take your lazy boy to heaven. <laughs> but you are taking your character to heaven. Do you understand that? You're not taking your comfort to heaven, but you are taking your character to heaven. And what God is doing in your life right now, even though it might be difficult, challenging, stressful, a struggle to be sure, God is developing your character, preparing you for being in heaven. That's a good thing, isn't it? He cares so much more about our character than our comfort. God's refinement, this is so important. You need to hear this. God's refinement is not making a mess of things or a mess of you. It's cleaning up the mess within you to prevent more mess around you. That is so worth saying. You should say it again, Pastor. Well, I think I will. I'll do it. Okay. God's refinement isn't making a mess of things or a mess of you. It's cleaning up the mess within you to prevent more mess around you. Does that encourage you a little bit? We need to surrender to God's growth process. That's not always easy, but it's always rewarding. And it's okay for you to do so because <laughs> you're his favorite. He's going to provide a way out. He's got this already. Put your head up. You've got a vantage point of favor. Put your head up. You can see it from a whole new different view. You got this because you've got me. Stand with me as we close. This Wednesday, we're going to take the Lincoln Brewster song, Made New, exploding with hope. You hold my head up. Remember that? I'm alive in you again. You hold my head up. And he, he does. He wants to help you get that vantage point of favor. To glory even in your tribulation. To speak to that mountain. You are nothing but a molehill. Instead of telling God how big our problem is, we just need to tell the problem how big our God is. Amen. Would you join me in doing that? Amen. Surrender. Surrender. Hmm. To do an inward step, it helps to do an outward expression. Would you? Hands up. Let's do that outward expression, surrender. And say right out loud when they say, Jesus, I surrender. I totally surrender. I give my life to you. 
I give everything to you. I surrender myself to you. I need what you're doing. I need you to renew me. I need you to transform me. I need you to help me to rejoice in hope and even glory in tribulation. To hold my head up because I know this is not an accident. Your fatherly favor filters. You have filtered the things that have come my way. And you are using those things to build my perseverance. And my perseverance to build my character. And I'm taking my character to heaven. And my character will release great hope into my life. So I am all yours. Forgive me for my past. Justify me by the precious blood of Jesus. Just as if I did never sinned. By your goodness. Now favor me. I am your favorite. I am your favorite. I'm yours, and you are mine, and I love you, and I welcome your work. Holy Spirit, have your way. You are the God of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. If you say, I needed this today, slip your hand up. Oh, good. Would you like some more of it next week? I've got more of it. I, I could have kept preaching another hour, but I said, no, 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 no. The mind can take in no more than the seat can endure. <laughs> so I've got more to share, and it's just so cool, and I want you to know about it because it will so, so help you. So next Sunday together, Wednesday night, we'll enjoy encouragement. In the meantime, my dear ones, I love you. God bless you. You are dismissed.